Hi, this is Amy, and today I'm going to interview Mike Van Elzeker. He's a researcher at Harvard uh, Medical School, and also he's an instructor at Tufts University. He studies a couple conditions, PTSD, and also the condition myalgic encephalomyelitis, um, sometimes also called chronic fatigue syndrome, called ME or ME-CFS, uh, depending on uh, what terms you use. And he studies PTSD as well. And one of his strengths is neuroimaging. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit with Mike about that. And before I do that though, Mike, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Amy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think you did a good job. Uh, I um, have a research lab at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, which is the teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. Um, and uh, we primarily study uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis uh, and also post-traumatic stress disorder. And our, uh, our, our main measures are neuroimaging, brain imaging, although we do other types of studies as well. Um, and yes, I, I also teach a, a, one class a semester at Tufts University. Cool. Well, Mike, my first question is, how do you do that? If you have a condition, MECFS, and you know this condition has been studied for a while as just a fatigue disorder. We, and then all of a sudden, there's indications that neuroinflammation may be involved. So how do you go about testing that? What methods do you use? How do you design studies? And how, what do you do to study neuroinflammation in a disease like MECFS? Yeah, so the, the key is that you have to try and study it non-invasively. So the original um, naming of the condition, myalgic encephalomyelitis, um, was back in a Lancet 1946 paper where they noticed that several outbreaks, including outbreaks across uh, you know, Western Europe and in Iceland, um, had sort of a similar presentation. Um, the term myalgic encephalomyelitis essentially means muscle pain associated with brain and spinal cord inflammation. Uh, and what they had noticed in this paper in 1946, they were tying together these different outbreaks and they noticed that in some studies, there were increases in proteins in cerebral spinal fluid as well as abnormalities uh, that were, um, uh, you know, that looked like it could be neuroinflammation in the spinal cord. Now, of course, those are two relatively invasive things to measure. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid you can do with a spinal tap, um, but to get actual spinal cord tissue, you have to wait until the patient dies uh, and then do that uh, upon autopsy. So the, the question that you know, we're working with is how do you study these things non-invasively in living people? Um, and we can use neuroinflammation, or excuse me, we can use neuroimaging to study neuroinflammation in living people. And we can do that in a couple different ways. Uh, the, the two primary methods that we use are functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. And then we also use positron emission tomography or PET, P-E-T. And then within each of those, those are basically different types of machines. Um, and then within each of those different types of machines, there are a lot of different specific methods that one can use depending on the specifics that you want to um, use and, and look at. And there's sort of strengths and weaknesses with, with each. Um, so, I mean, I can, I can tell, talk a little bit more about this if you like. I mean, essentially I can go into um, a little bit of what we use with fMRI and what we use with PET if that's interesting. Definitely, because okay. I work pretty closely with you, and even I sometimes get confused on which machine is doing what, and again, the strength and weaknesses of each um, technique in a way. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you want to go into that more, that would be awesome. Yeah, it's a really easy thing to get lost on because there's a lot of sort of technical details. Broadly speaking, there's kind of two ways to split up imaging just in general, medical imaging, and that's structural versus functional. So structural is a little bit like a still photograph. You're looking at the size and shape of structures, in our case, brain. Um, and you can tell a lot about that. So for example, um, if there is an unhealthy brain, the ventricles in the brain will be pretty large. Um, and ventricles are the, the, the sort of canals through which cerebral spinal fluid flows. And essentially, if the ventricles are large, it's a little bit like having a large donut hole. That means that the donut itself is small, right? So if the brain is unhealthy, then that means there's loss of gray matter, loss of brain cells, and the ventricles appear bigger. So you see that in some patients with myalgic encephalomyelitis, not all, 
um, but you see it in other neuro neurodegenerative conditions, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, et cetera. So that's structural. And then within structural, there's a lot of other things you can look at. So white matter hyperintensities, um, you can look at the size of perivascular spaces, which are little sort of fluid pockets around penetrating blood vessels, um, where the, the um, plasma and interstitial fluid from the brain sort of mix and flow in and out of the brain. So this, just literally the size of those things uh, and the shape of those things can tell you a lot about the brain's health. Um, with that, we tend to use magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, because it's got very good spatial resolution. So with the very modern uh, machines, you can really get down into the millimeter and even uh, you know, 500 micron, depending on how long a person can hold still, um, resolution. So you're getting to the point where you can look at subregions of small structures like the hippocampus. And that's again, the size and shape. Um, that's structural like a still photograph. Functional is more like a movie. Um, where it tells you about activity or what's happening in the brain. Um, that, that's not a still photograph, that's sort of an action. And it tells you there's a lot of different ways that you can do functional imaging. So blood flow, where's the blood flowing? Where is there oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood? Where are certain receptors located? Where are they active? Um, where is glucose being metabolized? Those are functional uh, imaging techniques. And that's what we mean with the F of fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So it's the same machine as an MRI, um, but what's interesting is that you can actually use it to measure many things uh, about function. So, um, you know, when you have anemia, you take iron, right? So the reason for that is that hemoglobin um, has a lot of iron in it, um, and which of course means that it is ferrous, which means it's magnetic it can be detected by very powerful magnets. And so hemoglobin that has an oxygen mo molecule attached to it has a slightly different shape than hemoglobin that does not have an oxygen attached to it. And with very powerful magnets like those seen in an MRI machine, um, you can actually detect the difference between blood that has oxygen, we call it oxygenated blood, um, versus deoxygenated blood. And so the functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, measure, the thing that we measure is called the BOLD response, B-O-L-D, blood oxygen level dependent response. And that just means it's the response that depends upon the level of blood oxygen, right? And that's you simply know, be, yeah. like that. I never knew that. I Nobody heard does. You say no. that, and I just thought it was a bold thing to do. I'm just yeah. joking, but okay. Right. Yeah, so right. And that's, it's, it's a really, I mean, in, in my world, these are things that people just say, right. um, but it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, for people that don't do neuroimaging, it's just one of those terms. And our collaborator, Ken Kwong, um, mm -hmm. who you've met, um, mm -hmm. is one of the co-discoverers of the bold response. So his great insight was that the, the blood that has oxygen in it would look a little bit different magnetically than the blood that did not have oxygen in it. Before then, before Ken came along, you injected stuff into people to see where blood was flowing. And so what they call that is the endogenous contrast. So contrast from within the body. And that was what Ken, Ken's great discovery um, back in the early 1990s. And we're very, we're very fortunate that he's fascinated um, and concerned about myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, he thinks about it. He writes me questions all the time and we chat about it a lot. And, uh, he's involved uh, in one of our studies. So that is the, the F of fMRI. Now, separately, PET is basically all function. You can do structural, but the resolution of PET is not quite as good as it is with MRI. Although to be fair, the resolution of modern day PET is about as good as the resolution of MRI from maybe you know, 40, 50 years ago. So it's catching up. Um, but PET, positron emission tomography, is uh, uh, another type of camera. And what that does is it takes advantage of radioactive decay. So when something is radioactive, the reason it emits energy is because it's constantly breaking down, right? And that basically means there's, a, there's these annihilation um, uh, events and that causes essentially photons to be released. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but um, it causes photons to be released. Um, and when radiation decays, you can measure that. 
Um, and so what PET takes advantage of is very weak radiation. People hear the word radiation and they get scared. I mean, you should treat it with respect, but this is a very low level of radiation. Uh, it, essentially, if we were to fly to Copenhagen, um, we would be exposed to about the same amount of radiation uh, as an injected uh, PET scan. Now, that's, you know, there are limits. The FDA says no more than five or six uh, research-related scans per year just to keep it well below the level of safety. But it's a very low level of radiation, and the, the PET camera is just extremely sensitive. And the way that the PET works is you take something that's biologically meaningful, something that is doing something in the, in the brain, in our case, that you care about. So for example, fluorodeoxyglucose, right? It's essentially a type of glucose. Mm -hmm. What you can do is to tag that with weak, rapidly decaying radiation. And so, where, and so let's say that I inject you with FDG fluorodeoxyglucose, and I ask you to flip on your, you know, play with your phone, scroll through your phone. You're just look at Instagram uh, for the next 40 minutes, right? You're just scrolling through your phone, looking at Instagram, right? And then I'll put you into the scanner. Well, you've just spent 40 minutes activating your visual cortex because you're doing all this visual processing. And so when I put you into the scanner, the place where all of that injected glucose, which normally would be provided by nutrition, uh, the place where that injected glucose went because you're using energy is the visual cortex in the back of your brain. So when the PET camera scans your brain, those annihilation events are happening way in the back of the visual occipital cortex. And you'll see that we call it lit up. Uh, you know, that'll be lit up in the image. And that is the functional part of, uh, of neuroimaging. And, you know, with PET, there's a ton of stuff you can do. It just depends on what is what we call the radio ligand. What is the thing of biological interest that you tag with radiation and inject. So in the case of neuroinflammation, we know that microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, when they activate, when they turn on, when they've, dis when they've um, detected uh, something associated with either damage or infection or inflammation, one of the things they do, they have this whole big response. Think of like a puffer fish, like puffing up, like a whole bunch of things happen. One of the things that happens is that it upregulates this one particular protein um, called the translocator protein, TSPO, sometimes called the per peripheral benzodiazepine receptor. It's a protein. Mm -hmm. um, but what you can do is an inject something that binds to that protein. So anywhere that that protein is being expressed in the brain or in the body, the thing you inject will bind to that, and therefore the radiation will decay from that spot. And what the PET camera does that you're sitting in this big machine that has this camera on your head is it detects where the annihilation event is happening within your brain and figures out exactly, okay, it's up here to the left, it's up here to the right. Uh, it figures out exactly where that's happening. And in that case, it can tell you where that protein is upregulated, which is a proxy for neuroinflammation. So that's a functional measure for neuroinflammation. Got that. Okay, so then now when you're doing this with MECFS, what have you decided to tag? Yeah, so it literally we're using the translocator protein because that's, that's kind of the best thing we have right now. Um, and people are, this is a whole area of research. People spend their careers on trying to find new ways to measure neuroinflammation within the brain. So with PET, we're using what's, uh, what's called PBR28. It's a second generation radio ligand. So there's a paper, Nakatomi 2014, which was a great paper, glad they did it. But they used a first generation PK11195, which is a little less, uh, it's got a little worse signal to noise. It doesn't penetrate the blood brain barrier quite as well. It binds to peripheral cells a little bit more. So there's a bunch of things that sort of could be improved with it, including just the number of people, relatively no, low number of people they studied. Super glad they did it, great study, and we're following up. And then okay. what we have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. We've got a machine, uh, we actually have two machines in my center, the Martino Center for Biomedical Imaging, where it's a dual PET MR. Mm -hmm. And so what they have done is they've embedded a PET camera into an MRI machine. So you can do both types of scans at the exact same time. Um, and the advantage of that is that you can take advantage of the really good spatial resolution of MRI and the really good biological sensitivity of PET. And you can sort of measure a whole bunch of things at once. And uh, you know, in addition to fMRI bold response, uh, 
you can also look at the magnetic properties of other things other than hemoglobin. And that includes uh, things like myelin acetal, NAA, glutamate, uh, GABA, um, other things that are associated with inflammation. It's really hard to just look at um, the magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is done with the MRI machine, and just say, ah, yes, neuroinflammation, we've got it. Um, these are things that are associated with neuroinflammation. It could mean a lot of different things. Um, so like, for example, um, Jerry Younger did a whole brain MRS study where he showed increased choline um, and, uh, and in increased lactate. Those definitely are things that are associated with neuroinflammation. They are associated with other things as well. So like choline, for example, is associated with cell division. Um, and so I know I don't think that the brain is rapidly dividing in these patients. Um, but one of the things that you'd want to do is to use multiple methods to make sure that we're really interpreting that signal correctly. Um, and that's one of the advantages of using a PET MR is you can look in the same brain structure for these multiple different measures. You're getting at it from different angles um, and you can use these different ways to measure neuroinflammation or lack thereof uh, so that you can feel a lot more confident that it's happening uh, and that perhaps it's happening in specific circuits. Got it. Yes. I like that. It's kind of like a, not two for the price of one, but sort of like two for the time of one and effort in that, you know, if a patient makes the, you know, sacrifice to come in for one of these studies, you can get just a maximum amount of information between the two different techniques and the two different tools. Exactly. It's almost like an in-house replication. You're replicating yourself in the exact same moment. Very cool. Right. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And then I guess what, I, because I'm by you, at Martinos, um, you even have a seven Tesla scanner, correct? Which is a, you describe it. It's yeah. fMRI, but- So Tesla um, is not just a, an annoying billionaire's company. It's also a unit of measurement for the strength of magnets, right? So uh, you know those junkyard uh, cranes that pick up a car uh, with a big strong magnet and lift it up and move it you know, into a pile of cars, right? Uh, yeah. The strength of magnet it takes to lift up a car is about one Tesla. That's a unit of magnetic strength. So sort of a standard clinical small community hospital MRI has a 1.5 Tesla MRI, right? So that's a really strong magnet, right? So this is the reason that I wear sneakers to work is because men's shoes uh, usually have metal in them uh, and you don't, you can't go into the room with metal. Um, you know, you if you have like if if I'm wearing my security badge, I go into the room and it goes and it just lifts right out towards the machine because the magnet is so very strong. So we need a video of that. Yeah, no, it's it's pretty amazing actually, and there's there it's it's obviously can be really dangerous. So it's like no joke. Like you get huh. these people that like you know, well-meaning people that walk in there with a, with a clipboard or something and it just flips out of their hand, you know, it's, it's a nightmare. So that's why we have, me, you know, metal detectors as you walk in, alarms, really strong safety protocols. So a sort of a research scan, a normal research scan that most, you know, universities have um, for MRI is a three Tesla. So that's obviously super duper strong. The Martino Center where I work has two seven Tesla MRIs. That's extraordinarily strong. And the, the, the reason that that's good is that um, it gives you a, a better signal to noise. Now, it's not just pure positivity. There are some bigger problems as well that are sort of technical, like you get what's called a, a sinus artifact uh, and things like that that are exaggerated with larger strength. Mm -hmm. But for the tissues that you're able to pick up, the resolution is much, much stronger. And importantly, in spectroscopy, when you're looking at the chemical composition within brain tissues, you have a lot better signal to noise with the seven Tesla. Um, and they're fundraising um, to try and build, I think, like a 16 Tesla, um, oh, which wow. is just crazy. So we're getting to the point where in a living human being, uh, we can probably within the next 10, 15 years, we can start to get within maybe like, you know, like a dozen cell cluster resolution or something. It's pretty crazy. Um, and, and of course, if you do ex vivo, where there's a cadaver just lying there that can obviously hold still for 24 hours, you <laughs> could really get single cell resolution with that type of strength. Um, you just let the scanner just go, 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 go for 24 hours um, with no 
no pulse, no heartbeat, no breathing to move, which just like a still photograph causes blurriness. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get extraordinarily good uh, spatial resolution. That is so cool. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think is a strength about Martinos, where you do the imaging and where you work, is that the people, the scientists who, who make the machines work at Martino. So yeah. it's kind of like Ken Kwong, who you mentioned was on your team, who literally invented the fMRI technique. Um, I'm pretty sure, isn't it Jonathan Palamani or other people who are yeah. sort of on one of the seven Tesla projects you're proposing for MECFS? Yeah. Um, they didn't he build the seven Tesla? Yeah, John is an amazing right. dude. Like he's right. he's one of those MIT people that's just right. so just like he's just incredibly sweet and nice and he just like builds MRIs, you know, like this is what yeah. they did. The, the, the building across the street from mine um, is where all the physicists, you know, all the right. people that are into physics work. And they literally, what they do over and over again is to build MRIs. Uh, and what they do is they, they try to build them with different, you know, different sort of, so like one problem, for example, just a medical problem in the world is how do you image a fetus? You cannot ask a fetus to hold still, right? right. With MRI, you have to hold still or the image is blurry and it's screwed up, but you can't ask a fetus to hold still. So they try to change the properties of the MRI so that it can get a very quick, but reasonably detailed so you can see if there's some gross anomaly. Um, and so yes, the first seven Tesla that was at the Martino Center was built in house. Uh, mm -hmm. And the one that we just got a couple of months ago um, was actually built by a company and purchased like normal. Um, but they actually built the old one uh, themselves. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's just really cool. And what's fun about that is somebody like John Palomani, who is, um, who is helping us with, uh, we're trying to start up a seven Tesla project in MECFS um, to get at some of the sort of uh, cranial cervical brainstem, um, st again, structural, not functional. Structural leads to functional um, and functional can lead to structural, but sometimes you measure one or the other. Um, but he's involved in that and his, you know, one of his great interests is studying the vasculature of living brain, which is a hard thing to do, right? By definition, it's moving and pulsing. Um, and these are things that normally screw up an image. And this is sort of his specialization. So, and, and again, he was just really fascinated by uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. You know, uh, uh, the people that in my experience have had a really sort of a, a healthy balance between seeing it as a sort of a cool challenge from a scientific perspective and seeing it as an injustice that um, you know patients have been neglected and it's an understudied condition where you know i mean the the fact that everybody with this condition hasn't had a brain scan that's just 101 um right. you know right. i mean it's just it's just crazy so um this is one of the things that we'd like to to rectify and in doing so what we'd like to do is to build sort of pipelines where uh, a non-expert radiologist um, can learn a little bit from us and have some clues of what to look for um, so that they don't miss things that might be a little bit subtle or might be considered no big deal. So, you know, the e example that I mentioned before is perivascular spaces, right? Yeah. Those exist in people um, that, you know, there's these sort of little around penetrating blood vessels. There's these little spaces where interstitial fluid flows. Everybody's got them. Uh, as you get older, they're a little bigger. Um, but what we see in general um, is that they're a little bit larger and a little bit more numerous in people with MECFS. Now, a normal uh, neuroradiologist would sort of see that as incidental, not that important. Um, but maybe we can, when we build the pipeline for MECFS, that's something that they can pay a little bit more attention to and say, well, maybe in this case that it's a little bit more evidence of, of something mechanistically that we, that we may be concerned about. Got it. So in other words, right now you're at the stage where you're doing a more limited number of scans, but you're really working with the top people there on how to interpret them, how to conceptualize them, all the details of really getting the imaging and the interpretation as tight as possible. Then you'll get to the stage where hopefully you can bring people in who can do that on a larger number of patients um, and not require the literally the person who invented the fMRI technique on it. And then you might get to the point where a clinician or just a doctor in an office might be able to order an MRI and begin to look for things in that MRI, like perivascular spaces that they might be able to do in a clinical visit that could tell just patients generally in the world that there might be something, an indicator of something um, off with their brain. 
Yeah, I mean, my dream at MGH and Harvard Medical School is to work with a bunch of people of different specializations to create a pipeline yeah. where someone with this diagnosis can enter the pipeline and get tested in multiple ways in a coordinated fashion. Because, you know, I, I usually try to say this diagnosis and not this disorder, because the fact is that a big story in this diagnosis is that there are multiple causes, right? So you can argue that it's a misdiagnosis. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't want to abandon people that got sick in outbreaks, um, but I think there's probably a story where someone got sick in an outbreak versus someone has a pre-existing structural issue. And then maybe that was provoked in some way by uh, like, let's say a viral illness or something like that. And what we want to do is to do sort of individualized investigation in a thoughtful a priori way um, where we can sort of run somebody through this pipeline and sort of say, oh, this person has X problem here, but this doesn't look so bad. Or this person has, you know, this doesn't look so bad, but they have X problem here. And we can sort of look through the multiple, um, the multiple pathways that one could arrive at, at this diagnosis. Absolutely. That Including makes sense why you're coming, exactly, coming from everything from structural issues to actually inflammatory issues so you can better figure out what's going on per case and then to kind of correlate. No, and you know I share your pipeline dream. You know that I, what I am trying to do is, is contribute to the same, similar, what could really be called the same pipeline, where we'd also at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital be collecting, this is plan, cerebral spinal fluid, blood, uh, surgical samples from patients with ME-CFS and related diagnoses, and we'd also be trying to analyze those samples and possibly other things um, in a pipeline type fashion as well, where over time um, we can basically become more and more confident in the technologies and techniques we're using to, you know, identify, in my case, guests, you know, organisms, pathogens, um, you know, inflammatory processes. So, yes, I mean, yeah. and because the, the reason that, you know, you and I want to work together on that is because neuroimaging can only tell you so much. I cannot tell you the difference between a herpes virus and an enterovirus when I look at a brain scan of neuroinflammation. All I see is that endpoint. Um, and in my opinion, um, a big problem in medicine in general and in this field in general is that there's a lot of examination of endpoints and not enough examination of what is driving to that endpoint. And I think that matters. Um, and that's how you end up in a situation where you say, oh, B cells look funky. Let's wipe out the B cells. And that, to me, that does not, that's not a, a good strategy. You have to ask why. What is driving that problem? You can't just why? look at endpoints. I agree. Yes. And I think you are invaluable to me with your neuroimaging because of how hard it is. For example, you know, my interest is trying to better understand potential pathogens and microbe activity in these patients, in patients with ME-CFS. And the central nervous system is where I'm most curious and interested in the fact that they may persist there. Um, now, I can better come up with ways to, you know, in cerebral spinal fluid, either directly find the pathogen or infer the presence of a pathogen based off a of protein it creates, or possibly look at immune cell activity in the cerebral spinal fluid and see if it might be reacting to a pathogen, all things that we're going to try to do. But overall, I can't really tell if a pathogen is impacting a living patient. Um, I can't get, the only way now that we can study pathogens in brain tissue is via autopsy. So once someone has passed away, we can study that brain and there we can extract the genetic material that may correspond to a pathogen. We can stain the brain, see if we can find pathogens or their proteins. But how do you assess that? The fact that there might be inflammatory processes in someone who hasn't died yet. That's yeah. where your work is so critical because let's say I find some signal, pathogen signal in the cerebral spinal fluid or even the blood or even in a tissue understanding that there's an inflammatory process in that patient's central nervous system or brain and what it is can help me infer what that organism might be doing. Because for example, when you talk about microglia, which are the brain's resident immune cells that basically target pathogens and can sometimes become infected themselves by pathogens. If you, for example, find that those cells are activated in a certain region of the brain or whatnot, that can allow me to then come up with ways to better say, 
could a pathogen contribute to that microglia inflammation and how do I figure that out, right? So bouncing our data off each other yeah. is very helpful. I mean, and it's one of those things where I think it's another mistake that the field has repeatedly made where let's say, just as an example, and I'm not saying that this is the root, but mm -hmm. let's say HHV3, right? So the zoster virus, chicken pox, right? Over 99% of humans have that. And so if you do some antibody tests, well, gee, yeah, they've got antibodies to that, so what? Uh, and that, therefore, the, the erroneous conclusion is, is like this, right? The erroneous logic is this. All people have HHV3, all, close to all. Not all people are sick. Therefore, HHV3 must not contribute to sickness, right? That's, that is erroneous logic, right? So um, that's, that's, a, that's a logical fallacy. So there are lots of things that organisms can do, including my pet interest, which is just location where is it? That matters, right? It's a really basic thing, right? In real estate and medicine, location, where, you know, where is this infection happening? Um, yes. And so to be able to look in cerebral spinal fluid, which is something that we're working on with Karen Book, the neuroradiologist who we've recently started working with is super cool. How can we look in cerebral spinal fluid to look for the organism itself, the organism's genetic material, the organism's protein products, the immune response to the organism itself and the immune response to the organism's protein products, all of which are things that you can measure because not every organism that can affect the subjective feeling of health is just dancing out there in fluid saying, find me, find me. It's hard. Um, they are smart, they hide um, and they can still affect. So, and, and you know, a good example really is the you know, you mentioned that microglia can become infected and that's true and so can astrocytes. So what I talked about, astrocytes are just another type of glia, right? Um, glia just means glue in Greek. It used to be thought that they held neurons together, but in fact, they're the immune cells of the brain. Um, astrocytes, named so because they look like stars, um, can become infected and they're preferentially infected by, for example, internal viruses. Um, so there are certain cell types um, that are preferentially infected by certain microorganisms. Astrocytes are the thing that comprise perivascular spaces. So they're the things that sort of line the outside of the perivascular spaces. And so if you had a situation in which you had both enlarged and activated perivascular spaces, so that's neuroimaging, enlarged is structural, activated is functional. And then in the same person, you had, for example, T cells that were raised against some antigen Pro, uh, produced by um, uh, by enteroviruses, for example, or uh, produced uh, against the RNA of enteroviruses, then you could really sort of infer, it's not direct until you get to autopsy, but you could really start to infer that maybe for this particular person, uh, a central nervous system infection of enteroviruses of the type that John Chia has reported, um, that might be the really important thing for this particular person. And I personally, think that it's going to take individual investigation. I know that's somewhat controversial. Some people think there is a virus for MECFS, which is, I, I don't dismiss that. I don't think that's true, but I don't dismiss it. Um, um, but I, you know, at the very least, you can start to do a little detective work um, on an individual basis by combining methods. And I think that's a really, uh, you have to be able to do it in a person that's alive um, uh, and to be able to sort of troubleshoot and solve. Yeah. I agree with you. And one of the things when it comes to what viruses may be involved in the condition, for example, another trend that we talk about is perhaps, and this is the case, is that different viruses might do something similar to different patients, right? And that's one of the things I was going to ask you is you're interested in brainstem. Um, and you've also been looking at a couple other regions of the brain, like the thalamus. Um, why are you focusing on those regions? Yeah, I mean, so some of it is just, it's sort of like the, the shape of traffic just is, is, is informed by the shape of the roads. So brainstem um, is essentially just the, the, it's sort of like the transition point between the brain and the spinal cord and periphery. Um, and so it's much more likely that we're going to get an infection in the periphery since it's just larger. We breathe in, right? We eat, uh, you know, you certainly could have stuff go through your nose or eyes, et cetera. Um, but when there's something in the periphery, um, the presence of an infection in the periphery is communicated to the brain via brainstem. Um, so essentially, 
the example I always give is some really cool rodent studies. Um, like Lisa Goler from a University of Virginia Medical School has done a lot of this work. So as an example, if you inject a rat with E. coli or with cytokines, a bacteria or with the inflammatory markers that the body creates upon detection of infection, right? If you inject them with something like that, the rat will act sick. They'll be tired, lethargic, they won't socialize, they won't eat as much, low-grade fever, et cetera, et cetera, unless you've clipped the vagus nerve. And then mm -hmm. the brain does not figure out that the body is sick, right? So the brain has to find a way to learn from the body, hey, we're sick down here, go to bed, uh, preserve your energy. Um, you need to be fighting this pathogen right now and you shouldn't be out there jogging and you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and that just literally happens via the brainstem. So vagus nerve to brainstem is the communication route um, Right. for inflammatory uh, processes. So again, it's a review. The vagus nerve is a, is a nerve, a key nerve that essentially when people talk about the gut brain axis, that's what they're, they're talking about that nerve, which means that vagus innervates at the brainstem, correct? Mm -hmm. And then will also goes branches down to the gut, which is a main area of signaling between the gut and the brain. But then the vagus nerve also continues. I think sometimes this isn't explained as well and innervates most uh, areas of the body and, you know, yeah. and connects and essentially signaling from that nerve. So you could have an issue in your lower spine and it's being communicated from that area to the brain via the vagus nerve. Yeah, and depending so, on what right. type of signaling, absolutely. So yeah. vagus shares the same Latin root as vagabond, which means to wander. Um, right. And what that means is that it wanders all over and innervates all the major trunk organs. This is the reason that you feel sick when you have a lung infection and you feel sick when you have a stomach infection. Um, those are different organs and yet you feel sick in at least somewhat overlapping ways. Now, I don't think that ME-CFS is the sickness response, but I think that the sickness response is a part of ME-CFS. And that's just literally communicated through the brainstem by way of the vagus nerve. Now that's when there's inflammatory mediators like cytokines in the periphery, which again, don't have to be circulating. These are paracrine signalers, which means nearby cells as opposed to endocrine, meaning they flow through the blood and signal elsewhere, right? So it's a big mistake to take blood from the left forearm, fail to see something and say, well, it must not matter. Sometimes it doesn't work that way and that's cytokines. Oh, that's so, um, so that's one of the reasons that the brainstem is important functionally. And then if we look at structurally, uh, if there's literal compression on the brainstem for one of multiple reasons, you can really end up with the same type of glial activation from compression, shearing, bending, uh, and that sort of thing. So um, glia are sort of, they just sort of react. Um, they react in relatively similar ways, depend, sort of independent of the insult, whether that's detection of inflammatory mediators, the direct detection of, of pathogens or some sort of a, a, an injury, compression injury. Um, so like, yeah. for example, um, if you, this is the reason, for example, let's say that someone is terribly badly injured and they lose an arm and they may for years and years feel terrible pain in a hand that's not even there anymore. Uh, that the glia surrounding the nerve there may have become activated and they're dumping out excitation onto the nerve uh, and that's just because the nerve, you know, it, even though the nerve signal is happening here, right. um, it's supposed to signal your hand. And so you may actually feel like you have pain in your hand, even if the hand's not there anymore. So that's this is just an example that. of injury, right? In, uh, an example it's of how injury can cause it. Great trend tied to infection, which, you know, is my greatest interest in that. I think a lot of people think so, and I understand that if they're, um, heart hurts, then the heart and infection were involved, that the heart must be infected itself. And not that it can't be. Sure. However, it yeah. really could just be that nerves, I don't know if the heart is the best choice, but nerves that are connecting to a certain organ um, are relaying a signal um, and that the infection is, the nerve is infected or yeah. there's some other process that isn't in the exact area. So, I mean, and it could be, but that yeah. really goes into, and I just 
wanted to go to what you call equifinality, which I really like. It's something we've connected on, which means that there are different routes towards similar clusters of symptoms that then are, can be diagnosed as potentially something yeah. like MECFS. And I think that the vagus nerve and brainstem alone is a good example just theoretically of how equifinality could work because you could have, and this is just coming from my perspective, the brainstem could be directly infected, for example, in someone. There could just literally be pathogens that got into the brain and infected the If the it's brainstem. too bad, they'll just die, but yes. Right, too, which would yeah. be in that, there could be some extreme cases, but right. since the vagus nerve is innervates the brainstem, perhaps as you've uh, written about, um, perhaps the vagus nerve instead is infected in some people, and that's dysregulating signaling that leads to similar symptoms as if the brainstem itself were directly infected. And then yeah. someone else might, like you said, have an infection in, in the periphery, anywhere else in the body that the vagus nerve innervates, and that um, the inflammatory molecules or the you know inflammation or just you know the the recognition of that pathogen might also change brainstem signaling in a somewhat similar way. And so all those people might result in having symptoms that could be diagnosed as something like MECFS, but they were somewhat different infections in different locations. Some, it might be a viral infection in one person, maybe a bacterial infection in one person. And then, like you said, someone else might have just had an injury or something else that also in, impacted the brainstem in a similar way, and they get similar symptoms. Now, if you combine that injury with an infection, you could see how you can sometimes, you know, double on the factor. So, so that right. goes down the road of, you know, helping when you say that you not, don't necessarily say that MECFS results from one single thing. I think that's what you're alluding to, correct? The diagnosis. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the and, you know, I, I'm completely yeah. open to the idea that yeah. there is a real ME, but the problem yeah. is that when someone walks up to me and says, I have ME, I don't know what that means to them. And part of my job then is to investigate. And from there, we can decide if they have real ME or not. Yeah. All I know is that they're suffering and they have some cluster of symptoms that overlaps um, with the same cluster of symptoms uh, to a greater or lesser extent that, that happen in the outbreaks. I mean, a good yeah. example of the thing that you were talking about is pain. So the um, nociception or pain signaling um, happens in the, what's called the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So dorsal, like dorsal fin of a shark, right? The back. Mm -hmm. So the back parts of the spinal cord um, is where pain sort of goes up. You can have broad, diffuse pain, like all over your legs, for example. Now that might mean that you have bee stings all over your legs, right? The injury is actually literally all over your right. legs. Or it could mean that you have an inflammatory process including driven by infection or injury in the dorsal horn of your spinal cord and all the nerves coming up from those places, feet, legs, calf, et cetera, um, converge on that point. And the signaling is being driven by activated glia, which act like an amplifier to yeah. amplify nerve signaling. Um, and so th that's an example of that. Then that literally is part of the reason that we feel more sore um, when we're sick. Um, it's uh, part of the sort of uh, the sickness response includes uh, soreness. That's the myalgic part of myalgic encephalomyelitis, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. Really cool. All right, well, Mike, well, this is a good discussion for today. I'm going to bring you back, and next time, let's talk about some of the early findings you're actually seeing on these scans with patients with MECFS. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Great talking awesome. to you. All right, thanks. Bye for now, Mike. Okay, see ya. Bye.